morning, brethren. Good morning. And special welcome to those who are listening to us on the internet. Uh, Hendy, uh, I'm not sure if Denise is with him, or if she's come back. I think so. I heard she went to Antigua. Yes, Antigua. <laughs> So, I hope you're making some good food these days. Yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> And to grind up in the cold, you know, we will wish you warmth. Okay, brethren, today we want to continue with Appreciating Christ, part three. So far, we've seen that uh, the being called the Word in the New Testament is the God who created the heavens and the earth, and that God is not one individual, but that there were two beings called God. One in the New Testament was referred to as the Father, and the other was called the Word. And the word who created the heavens and the earth is actually the God of the Old Testament, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've also seen that that word became flesh, meaning he became a human being. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And you can read the rest of it. And after he became flesh, he was known as Jesus Christ, which was a name that was given to him, or Joshua, or Joshua, or Emmanuel. Those were the given names to him as a human being. So there we want to delve into that aspect of him after he became a human being. Why did the Word decide to become flesh? To become a human being like us? Because of the stated intent in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 7, when it says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air. And to retrieve the situation that developed in Genesis chapter 3, and let us take a look at that. Genesis chapter 3, uh, let's go from verse <coughs> 11. Now after Adam and Eve defied God and he, he told them don't eat of the tree and as I said before that the tree was not an apple or any kind of fruit, it essentially is symbolic language for them deciding to make decisions on their own about what is good and what is evil. So he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. And again, the serpent is not a snake. The serpent is a symbolic term for referring to the devil. He beguiled me, and I did eat. And verse 14. And the Lord said unto the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, her seed, meaning one, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his he, and this referred to what would happen to Christ. The hit at events that will involve him when he became Christ way into the future. And let's just briefly take a look and see what this being looked like. Let's go to Exodus chapter 24. And let's go from verse 9. It says, Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, 
and seventy of the elders of Israel. And verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet as if were a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in his clarity in a cloudless sky. So I would no clouds. That's how blue uh, under his feet looked. But upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. And drop down to verse 16. <clears throat> uh, it says, And the glory of the Lord rested upon Mount Sinai. <clears throat> Uh, and the cloud covered it in six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And verse 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> if we look at Exodus 19. Verse 21, before they got the Ten Commandments. It says, the Lord said unto Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. So the idea that a spirit being is invisible, why would you, first of all, why would you have thick clouds if a spirit is invisible? And why would he warn them? Not to break through and try to look, to gaze, lest they perish. So spirit beings aren't invisible. It says it is like a consuming fire. And we see elsewhere in the New Testament, its face shines like the sun. So if you ever thought that a spirit being was invisible, they don't allow you to see him. But the reason is it will kill you if you, if you were to see him. So this is what this being, the God of Israel, looked like. And then we look a little bit as to the, some of the status, the abilities, and the power that the being called the wood had before he decided to give everything up and become human. We want to look at what motivated that decision. What motivated for him? It was the love for human beings. The desire to create a family of God beings. Notice John 3.16. We should all know this by heart. It said, For God so loved the world that he gave, he sacrificed, his only begotten Son, that whoso believed on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we see the Father the being called the Father, making such a decision to sacrifice his only begotten son and given who he was, try and put yourself in that situation and see if you would want to sacrifice your only child. Let's say your child was a scholar sometime. You won an island scholarship, went somewhere, got first class honors in something, got a PhD by 20 something years old, and is a noted whatever around the world. Would you be prepared to sacrifice him? And not just sacrifice him, but as we will see, sacrifice him and have him be humiliated, and sacrifice him for people who hated him. The Bible tells us, God so loved the world, meaning the people, human beings. The Father made that decision to sacrifice his only begotten Son. But what about the world himself? Well, John 1 tells us, John chapter 1 tells us, uh, in verse 12, but as many as received him, meaning the word, to them gave he power, or the right, to become the sons of God, even to them who believed on his name. So the being called the word 
by his sacrifice, he did it, so that as many as received him who believed on him, he gave them the right to become sons of God, or the children of God. So he was instrumental in producing sons of God. And let's see what motivated him, motivated him also. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. And let's look at verse 20. Now Paul is writing here. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, note, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now Paul is a man who persecuted the church, killed Christians, dragged them off the jail. And he had an experience, and now he is saved. Despite all that, the Son of God, the being who became Christ, loved me and gave himself for me. So the both God beings were motivated by love for human beings. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, uh, chapter 12, sorry. Hebrews chapter 12. And let's read verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, that is how he was killed, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Let us see what this entails. Now, Jameson Fawcett and Brown commentary said, Namely, of sit, after sitting on the right hand of God, including besides his own personal joy, the joy of sitting there as a prince and savior to give repentance and remission of sin. The coming joy, disarmed of his sting, the present pain meaning the, the sacrifice, and the cross and the shame, that was a great stumbling block to the Hebrews because, you know, they looked for a Messiah. But they could not fathom a, a Messiah who would be, the Romans would capture, hang him up on a cross, stab him in the side, and humiliate him. So they did not accept Christ as their Messiah. They looked for a Messiah who would come back and reestablish Israel as they would have heard of in the days of Solomon and David. So the Christ who was hung up on a stake, they could not accept. Crown of thorns on his head, bleeding, helpless. They couldn't accept that. Jameson Fawcett and Brown don't quite get the, two, the, the full picture, I fear. Because they look at his own personal joy, the joy of sitting there as a prince and a savior. That is not what was a joy for him. It says... The joy that was set before him. Now what was this joy that was set before him? Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 2. And let's look at verse 10. Now, verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with honor and glory, that he, by the grace of him, by God, should taste death for every man. So God so loved the world, Christ tasted death for every man, everybody in the world, because it says all of sin. And Christ made a decision to taste death, permanent death now, not just you dying a natural physical death. For verse 10, it says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, 
to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And here's how uh, the commentary went through it. They are breaking down that verse into little segments. So they started off with four. They said, giving a reason why the grace of God required that Jesus Christ should taste death. For it became him, and they're saying it became him, they said that the whole plan was not only derogatory to, but highly becoming of God. Though unbelief considers it a disgrace. The Jews considered it a disgrace because they did not believe in Christ. An answer to the Jews and Hebrew Christians, whatsoever or whosoever, through impatience at the delay in the promised advent of Christ's glory, were in danger of apostasy, stumbling at Christ crucified. As I said again, they could not imagine the Messiah that they were waiting for could have been crucified at the hands of the Romans. So this was the stumbling block for them. They could not accept Christ. The Jerusalem Christians especially were liable to this danger. The scheme of redemption was altogether such a one as harmonizes with the love, justice, and wisdom of God. So that the whole plan that God had devised, it became him, it was not only derogatory to that plan, but highly becoming of God. So that not only did it debase Christ, but it was highly becoming of God. And we will see a little bit at some other time why it was becoming of God to do that. Now it says, for whom and by whom of all things, here's what it said. It says, God the Father, uh, that the for whom of all things refers to God the Father. And it said the same is also said of Christ. For whom are all things and by whom are all things, because Christ made all things. All things in Greek, it says, means the universe of things. The all things, that is what it means. It says, he uses for God, uh, fancy what they use, the periphrasis, which is using many words when you could use a couple. So that instead of saying fake arguments, saying, for he became Christ, they say, him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, but you're still referring to the same person. Uh, they said that periphrase, uh, periphrases, him for whom and by whom are all things, to mark the becomingness of Christ's suffering as the way to his being perfected, as captain of our salvation, seeing that he is the way that pleased him, whose will and whose glory are the end of all things, and by whose operation all things exist. God chose it that way, that Christ would suffer and be humiliated. Later on it says that no flesh should glory, so that we are saved by that act, when the penalty that we would have deserved would be death. That act, he said, no flesh should glory, so that whatever we would do in our lives, uh, nothing could erase what Christ went through. And thereby, whatever we think we might be, or how good we think we are, nothing would erase that fact. That was caused by what we did. Uh, in bringing, they said, the Greek is past, and it means having brought as he did, namely, note, in his electing purpose. He elected to do that. A purpose which is accomplished in Jesus being perfected through sufferings. And many, in bringing many sons to glory, many refers to the church and elsewhere the general assembly. And sons, this are sons no longer children as under the Old Testament law but sons by adoption. And again, the, 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 the commentary writers, they don't quite see that God isn't adopting us. He is making us sons of God in the same way they did under the Old Testament, but not of the flesh. 
But in the same way we have procreation among human beings. He is now doing it in a spiritual manner. So that in the same way Christ became a son by being born as a human being. This is what God was actually doing. And Christ saw that. He saw that. And it says that was a joy to him to have that happen. We look at that a little bit more. Uh, in bringing many sons unto glory, unto glory, they said, is to share Christ's glory. And it says, sonship, holiness, and glory are inseparably joined. Now, I read to you what the glory of the Lord was in the days on Mount Sinai. I'm dealing with the literal glory, you know, his appearance. It was like a consuming fire. The glory also has other implications, as uh, the status he would have held among all other beings. Everybody else would have to defer to him uh, but the Father. They said suffering, salvation, and glory in, in Paul's writings often go together. Salvation presupposes destruction, deliverance from which, for us, required Christ's suffering. Destruction because we sin, and the wages of sin is death, death forever. And in order to be delivered from that, we require the Christ's sufferings, the sacrifice, which as they said. He died, he tasted death for every man. And the death they're referring to is not the natural physical death, but your permanent death. Because of the sin. Uh, it says, you know, sin was introduced into the world by one man, Adam, when he sinned. Sin came into the world, and after Adam, every human being has sinned. And so the plan to let us make man in our image would have been defeated because sin and death came on every man. And the, the, the penalty for sin is permanent death, death forever. And so to retrieve that, Christ volunteered to sacrifice his own life so that he, by the grace of God, would taste death for every man and thereby every other human being would not have to face that permanent death. The other part of the verse, uh, in bringing sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, James Fawcett and Brown says, that section of the sentence, it means to consummate, to bring to consummated glory through sufferings as the appointed avenue through it pointed avenue to consummated glory. It says, he who suffers for another not only benefits him, the person he is suffering for, but himself, the brighter, but becomes himself the brighter and more perfect. So that if you suffer for somebody else, it's in a sense that makes you bigger, because first of all, who volunteers to suffer for someone else? You know, so that if you who did no wrong can agree to suffer for somebody who did something wrong, that act, they said, makes you brighter and more perfect. It says, bringing to the end of troubles and to the goal of full glory. They said it is a metaphor from the contest in the public games. You know, in the the Grecian times, when you would have taken part in what they, 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 what they referred to as public game, referring to the Olympics, when you won that race and you got the laurel wreath, that was a mark of glory because it was given to you by whoever the emperor was. 
And if you were a slave, you'd obtain your freedom. They said here, or the, the writer, the comments, I prefer with Calvin understanding to make perfect as a complete sacrifice, legal and official, not moral. Perfection is meant to consecrate by the finished expiation of his death as our perfect high priest and so our captain of salvation. And it says, uh, it agrees with Hebrews chapter uh, Hebrews 2 verse 11. And it says, He that sanctifies that is consecrates them by himself, being made a consecrated offering for them. And they, they go on to explain that the perfecting of his consecration for them in his death. He perfects their consecration and so throws open access to glory. So that by his consecrating us, by his death, he has now opened the doors to glory. That we now could have access to the glory. Now the Hebrews 2.11 that they refer to, let's turn to it. Hebrews 2.11, here's what it says. For both he who sanctifies... And they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to recall them brethren. Now that is the King James Version. He that sanctifieth, they say that Christ, who once for all consecrates his people to God, bringing them nigh unto him as the consequence and everlasting joy by having consecrated for having consecrated himself for them, in his being made perfect as their expiatory sacrifice through sufferings. And here's what they say. God in his electing love by Christ's finished work perfectly sanctifies them. And I'm not quite sure why they're using the third person, but let us substitute that. Christ's finished work perfectly sanctifies us to God's service and to heaven once for all. We, then we, are progressively sanctified by the transforming spirit. And here's what they said. Sanctification is glory working in embryo. And glory is sanctification come to the birth and manifested. In other words, now that we are human beings, we have to, they consider that an embryo. Sanctification, meaning removing from us our sins, it is glory in embryo. But glory, when we now look like him as it says, sanctification has come to the birth. So that when we are born as sons of God, we will now have glory. And glory, as I said, is not only the fame, but also the physical appearance. The brilliant, shining expression under your feet looking like, like, like sapphire. Your eyes like fire, you, you, you know, and they didn't give different parts. But there are other places where you see he's a multicolored being. His, his, uh, his, knee, his, his ties and calves, etc. They look, if you've seen um, the multicolored bands that you see on Venus, that kind of a, a, a color. That's what he looks like. And around this midsection, it looks like amber. So he's a multicolored being. And when we become spirit beings, that glory will be manifested. They who are sanctified refers to us. And it says, they who are being sanctified. So that the process of us being sanctified is being engaged in through life because we still do sin. But by the sacrifice that he did, his death, he is in the process of sanctifying us, setting us aside for something, a special purpose. And as Hebrews 2.11 says, you know, for they are all of one. 
of one it says of the father of God not in the sense wherein he is the father of all beings including angels for they are excluded by the argument but he is father of his spiritual human sons so that we will now become sons we were once human but we becoming sons the same way Christ is the son they said Christ the head an elder brother and his believing people the members of the body and family thus this and the following verse are meant to justify his having said in bringing many sons which is what let us make man in our image after our likeness that was said way back in Genesis so from whatever man was created that was the purpose that was the goal and that is what Christ saw and that is what he it says the joy that was set before him to have many sons being produced like him Christ saw that as a joy and because that was joy for Christ he agreed to be sacrificed to sacrifice himself to give up who he was and become as a human being It says here, of one, uh, all of one as it says, it says that of one is not of one father, Adam or Abraham, not referring to human beings, as others suppose. It says the Savior's participation in the lowness of, of our humanity is not mentioned until Hebrews 2.14. Where it says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of flesh and blood. That through death, through his death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Who tempted Adam and Eve to sin and tell them, no, go and eat the fruit. God tells you that, but no, you don't really need to take that on. God knows the day you eat, uh, you're going to become smart like God and he doesn't want you to know that. You're not going to die. So you see how uh, the adversary, as they said, from day one, plan to thwart what he thinks, to thwart what God had in mind. Moreover, it says, sons of God in scripture usage refers to the dignity obtained by our union with Christ. Notice the dignity obtained by our union with Christ and our brotherhood with him flows from God being his and our father our brotherhood from him flows being the God being his father and our father Christ's sonship by generation meaning as a descent from God in relation to God is reflected in the sonship and again, <clears throat> they refer to by adoption of his brethren. And again, the Bible commentators could not see. So they think of adoption. That is the only how they could see it because it was inconceivable to them that human beings like us could be a begotten being the same way Christ was. So they use adoption. And I had someone try to defend to me, well, in ancient times, by adoption you had a similar kind of rights, etc. You know, you, you would have gone through and you would have had. But that is one thing. You could have all kind of legal rights as adoption, but as I make the point, when you're adopted, you don't share DNA. You can't go back in the in the person's ancestry and link yourself to anything. You can't see yourself in the family tree. That is what happens when you're adopted. Whatever the adoption would give you. You can't go back and say my great 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 grandfather was an athlete and therefore uh, 
you might not have any athletic prowess in the room. You don't see a kicking up down the road because that is not within your DNA. You may be artistic in one field or another. If you're adopted, that doesn't happen. You can't find an ancestor to whom you share some kind of physical resemblance, even if you happen to be of the same ethnic group. But they're telling us that Christ's sonship is reflected in the sonship of his brethren, meaning us. They said he is not ashamed. He's not ashamed to recall them brethren. They said, though being the Son of God, since we now have a sonship, again they use adoption, obtain the like dignity. We have now attained the similar dignity to Christ by virtue of being sons of God. So that His Majesty is not compromised by brotherhood with us. In essence, what they're saying here, He is not ashamed. He's not ashamed because we now are just like Him. We have the same Father. We belong to the family of God now. And therefore, he has no reason to be ashamed. Because we are now, by sonship, obtained a similar dignity to him. So that his majesty, as being God again, is not compromised by brotherhood with us. Because we're going to be like him. Because we're going to be children of the same father. They said this is a striking feature in Christianity, this brotherhood with Christ, that it unites such amazing contrasts, and they quote as our brother and our God. And then they quote something here that St. Augustine said. They said, God makes sons of men, sons of God. Because God has made of the Son of God, the Son of Man. So as it says here, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he likewise himself took part of the same. He became flesh and blood. That through death he might destroy them that had him that had the power over. But not only that. It's one thing for him to be up here and be divine. But he gave that up. To become like us. So that we have a common thing. Common as a human being, he knows what it was like to be a human being. And when we begin to share the glory, we will now experience what it was like for him to be a God being. So in everything, we kind of equal. He's a human being, we were human beings. He was a God being, we are now become a God being. And he decided to share that with us. And that was part of the joy. He considered that to be a joy. That he was prepared to give up everything in who he was. Now, who do you know in this life? I mean, sometimes we see in some of these movies. Uh, perhaps one of the, the more famous ones was, was the, the television series called Dallas. With the Ewing family. And... Uh, <clears throat> the firstborn son, J.R. Ewing. He wanted to own, I don't remember the name of the company, I remember they had a ranch called South Fork, or Ewing on it. He wanted to own that and be the big man running it one day. And one day when it was discovered 
that the father had a child out of wedlock and was going to give him a share in that. Nothing sparked the kind of hatred and resentment that you could possibly imagine. And his whole life thereafter was to conspire to exclude that, what he called bastard stuff, from inheriting anything. But the difference now we will see with Christ. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy, that is us, we have the same Father. And if we have the same Father, then we family. He is our brother, and we are his brothers and sisters, as the case may be. And it says, that is why Jesus is not ashamed to call us. They keep referring to them and in the third person, you know. He's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. In verse 12, for he says to God, Christ is saying this to God, I will declare the wonder of your name to whom? Let's go read it, brethren. Hebrews. Hebrews 2, verse 12. Christ is saying this to the Father. I will declare the wonder of your name to whom? Who is he saying he's going to declare it to? My brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your people. The New International Version renders part of that which it says. But the one who makes them, who makes men holy, who makes us holy, and those who are made holy, are of the same family. And what Christ referred to us as? I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. And brethren, you know, you're being brothers and sisters to our God. A God being. And how else could you be a brother and a sister to a God being if you're not a God? But you see the translators and the, the, the commentary writers couldn't see that. That is inconceivable to them. You're adopted. You know, you're adopted, so you're kind of... But Christ views you as my brothers and sisters. Because we're going to be of the same family. And this is what he made possible. So the father sacrificed his only begotten son because of love. His love for human beings. And the word Christ did what he did likewise because of love for human beings. Let us take a look at Romans chapter 5. And see how Paul puts this here. chapter 5 and let us read from uh, verse 6 it says for when we were yet without strength meaning we had no ability to um, resist sin and to make ourselves sinners in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, meaning he died for us. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. You may, in, in life, human things, you may for, uh, there are people who would die for their leaders, you know, uh, they say they would take a bullet for whoever. But even then, it's a bit, a tough ask. Ask somebody to sacrifice yourself to give your life for a righteous man. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. You know, uh, people in revolution, etc. 
would be prepared to give up themselves for whichever political leader it was or revolutionary that, that they decided to follow. But, verse 8, God commands, He commands what towards us? Verse 6, it said, God commands, what did he command towards us? His love. The Father loved the whole world and gave his only son. Why? Because he loved the world. And Christ gave up who he was because he too loved the world. God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And drop down to verse 10. It says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So that we, brethren, were enemies of God. The Clark's Bible commentary says, We are enemies. Sin indulged increases in strength. Evil acts engender fixed and rooted habits. The mind everywhere poisoned with sin increases in perverseness. Uh, increases in averseness from good. So it is averse to good and it gets worse and worse. It rejects good as far as possible. And mere aversion produces enmity. And enmity produces acts of hostility, fell cruelty, etc. So that the enemy of God hates his maker and his servants. And as Paul said, when we were enemies, God made a decision to have his only begotten son die. We were so much his enemies, brethren, that we killed him. And still he said, let us go read this in Luke. You know, why he was being killed. Hung up on a cross with nails stuck through. You know, they, they, they show you in some of these things the nail in the palm. Some other people said the nail wasn't in the palm, you know, only in the way. It was through the wrist head. And he was hanging up like this. And that is taking your whole weight. Luke 23, and let's look at uh, verse 32. It says, and there were also two other male factors, two other offenders, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. His enemies, brethren, we were his enemies because it was our sin that caused that to happen. We were so much his enemies, we killed him. And he said, at that point in time, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. 
And after that act, he is now acting as a high priest. So that when we sin and the penalty is death, he could go and plead for us to tell the Father to accept my sacrifice in that person's stead. Give him a break. And then God used that death so that our sins could be forgiven and our diseases healed. And Christ regarded the process of giving the same people who crucified him the opportunity to become sons of God. Despite the humiliations, and I mean, you can go read yourself. It says in, in, in you know, um, they took his garment and they gambled for it. Now that is putting it kind of nicely and mildly. When they took his garment, what do you think he was left with? Most likely he was naked. Hanging up on a cross. That people can pass around and see him strung up like this, naked. And mock him. It says some, you know, you said you could heal, you know. You could, why not come down from the cross? So knowing that this is what he would go through, he nevertheless did it. He was prepared to endure the cross. And, and, and the word despise. Despise is an interesting word. You know, you know when, when, you, when you despise something, you're dealing with a strong feelings against it. So he despised the shame. Why shame? Because he was crucified as a criminal between two criminals. He died a death that was reserved for criminals. Had the soldiers punch him in the face and laugh. You know, and they, they would say buffeting. Buffeting is merely an old English word. It's punch you in your face. Uproar of that. <laughs> Tell me who it was. Prophesy who, who just punched you. you know, take a crown of thorns and stick it on his head. You say you're a king? All right. <clears throat> Look up, crown. So he was prepared to, to endure that crown. Despite the shame. And remember who he was, brethren. I mean, which one of us? You know, you've done nothing wrong. You decided, well, you know, somebody did something wrong. I will bear the penalty. And then they drag you down to court. And you're in this yellow jumper or orange jumper. And you, you know, with handcuffs and chains. And Photographers putting cameras in your face and snapping, you know, snapping pictures and they publish all over the papers and on television. And you live a life where you had nothing to do with any kind of crime and you don't have to endure that. How would you feel? You know? Would you be prepared to endure that? But he did. And therefore we have to ask ourselves, what kind of person is it who would regard humiliations and the degradation inflicted on him as a joy? And more. Let us look at Romans. Romans 8.
Romans 8, and let's go from, from verse 1. It says, therefore, there is, not, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the righteousness of the law, the law says, thou shalt not do this. And if you don't do it, then it is considered righteous. If it says do it, and you do it, that is considered righteous. So that the righteousness of the law Honor thy father and mother. You may not have done it in your personal life. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You may not have even thought about doing that. Your life was, as they say, fornicating all over the place. But the righteousness of the law, which is thou shalt not, might be fulfilled in us. So that... All of what the law would have imposed, and in this case, death, went on Christ. And if we drop down to drop down to verse fifteen. says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage of slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, and again, they can't see it, we have received the spirit of sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It's a kind of a, an honoring now of the Father, having taken us from death. Abba is a now a term of endearment. And verse 16, it says, the Spirit bears witness, Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. And what? Joint heirs with Christ. So not only, brethren, were we his enemies, not only were we were responsible for his death, He gave up everything who he was. Gave up the godliness and the glory and the power and everything. And became a human being. And more than that, after all this. Not like J.R. Ewing. He has now decided to be, to share his inheritance with us. We are now joint heirs with Christ. So we're going to inherit whatever else he has inherited. If so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be what glorified together. So what kind of a being is this, brethren? That we humiliate, kill him, do everything that you could imagine. And he goes through a painful process. To remove all of the encumbrances from us. All of the penalties, etc. And then after he has done all that, he now comes around and decides to share his inheritance with us.
the people who hated him, enemies as it says. And kill him. And so, brethren, you see why I say we should learn to appreciate Christ. What being you know in this human life? Who do you know will ever do that? Here we have an example of someone who knows. And brethren, we in life sometimes, you know, some little incident, somebody says something or a thing, and we get bent out to shape. I, I can't do it. I ain't coming here. I don't want to see. <laughs> Look what they did. Look what he suffered. He has gone through, and after all that he went through, at the end of it all, he is now willing to share, to make you an heir, so that you can share in the inheritance that he had. So that when we examine our own selves and our own lives, Experiences that we see so often in life. I remember seeing another thing on television. Man had a hundred million dollars, you know. And got a girl pregnant. And <clears throat> When she discovered who her real father was, she went to get her share of whatever the father had. Now, you would think that you only had three children. You think 30 million, 30 something million, or even if you give her 20 million, you have 80 million to share between the other two. You think that that'd be enough for anybody to live on. But they felt, no, she had no right to this. And so what they did, they conspired to murder the woman, to prevent her from getting it. But here this Christ is now prepared to share his inheritance. And the more you have, apparently, is the less you want to share. Because it becomes too big to give away to somebody. Especially when you don't think that that person warrants it. But this, brethren, is what Christ was prepared to do. And what he has done. So that we who were his enemies and who hated him should not only have, as they said, uh, eternal life, but we will now share, become part of the family. And you know how these people get along with their family. You can't bring just anybody in their family when they think they're up here. They will reject you. They will scorn you. They will do everything. But Christ taught that bringing us into the God family is a joy that he looked forward to. And so, brethren, as I say, next time we will look at some more of what he's now doing to make sure that we get into the God And as I said, this is another reason why we should be appreciating Christ when we sit and we look at all that he has done. I don't know how else we could express, you know, uh, That's it. That is the only how we could. We need to express appreciation, as I said, develop these affective feelings towards one who would go to the, the, the extent that he has. And we will see a little bit more of that next time. In the meantime, you can go and do some of your own studies, and as we approach that time, the Passover, you can perhaps go and see a little bit more about the sacrifice that he made. So until next time, we'll